Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Assessing Industry Benchmarks for Energy Savings and Sustainability. I'm Jennifer Getz, the Editorial Director of Facility Executive Magazine, and this webinar is presented by GridPoint. Before we get started, I'll cover a few housekeeping items. There will be a Q&A portion at the end of the, our, our presentation today. Please find the question box in the dashboard on your screen. This is where you can submit questions for our speakers today. If at any time you experience a technical difficulty, please send us a message via that question section and someone on our team will answer you privately. And now I'm happy to introduce your speakers. John Cannon is a solutions engineer at GridPoint with a strong background in industrial control systems and automation technologies. Cannon is an energy management system expert with specialized expertise in sustainability, smart building controls, and energy optimization technology. In the past, Cannon developed large-scale power monitoring applications for data centers as part of Schneider Electric's Energy Solutions Group. He also contributed to the development of drives and automation automated solutions while working with Rockwell Automate Automation's Local Solution Centers Group. Scott Stewart is a senior energy data analyst at GridPoint, a leader in building energy management and optimization technology that decarbonizes commercial buildings and drives grid modernization. Stewart brings over nine years of experience in building science and energy management. His extensive experience has honed his ability to dissect facility data and apply sustainable energy manage management solutions effectively. In his six years with GridPoint, he has worked to analyze facility data to implement and maintain sustainable energy management management practices that improve operational efficiency and maximize energy savings. So Scott and John, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Well, once again, welcome everybody. Um, uh, once again, my name is John Cannon. Um, on the agenda today, uh, we're going to cover GridPoint's commercial energy efficiency report. Um, we're going to use that um, and kind of reference uh, understanding industry benchmarking. Um, then we're going to discuss the benefits of peer comparison and benchmarking. Um, you know, we'll discuss the impacting, uh, uh, impact of rising energy costs on commercial building operations, um, grid reliability challenges, and then we'll start looking at strategies for continually achieving benchmarking goals and you know how to get started. So GridPoint commissioned a commercial building uh, energy efficiency report. Um, it had over 800 respondents and um, they were from the United States and Canada. Um, also they were um, employed in managerial roles uh, involved in their organizations, uh, energy, sustainability, uh, or facility making decisions. Um, also, if you look at the demographic of what they were managing, 64% um, were managing facilities that were under 50,000 square foot, and 32% of them was managing facilities or sites that were over 50,000 foot. Um, also, it can be broke down that 47% uh, 40, uh, of them um, had uh, less than 15 buildings or, or 50 buildings or sites, and 53 um, had more than 50 sites that they were managing. So, um, and then additionally, um, the majority of the respondents, um, they did work in the retail uh, sector, uh, 40%, um, followed up by services at um, uh, financial services at 17%, uh, healthcare at 14%, and then restaurant and food services at uh, 10%, and then a, a balance that was, you know, uh, unidentified. You know, but today um, during this webinar, uh, we're going to be asking you several um, uh, high-level questions that are the same that we used in the commercial uh, building energy efficiency report. You know, so if you decide to participate, um, you're already kind of on a great start to comparing, um, you know, your company compared to um, some industry uh, peers. 
So um, why is benchmarking um, uh, important? Well, um, first off, what it is, it's commercial benchmarking is a process um, where a business is comparing um, their practices, their performance, um, their key metrics against like peers or competitors. Um, they're in the same industry or sector. You know, and the primary goal of that is to, you know, benchmark how well, you know, your company is performing relative to industry, you know, standards. Um, and that can, you know, allow you to identify areas where improvement can be made. So, you know, it's a pretty good insight, you know, at least a reference point um, for business to kind of gauge, hey, what is our own performance? Um, and then, you know, set goals for improvement. Uh, and then of all the, the benchmarking that we could talk about, uh, today we're specifically talking about energy savings and sustainability efforts. And, you know, why is that important? Well, the U.S. Department of Energy estimates that commercial buildings um, account for about 18 percent of total energy consumption in the United States. So, you know, not only is energy a massive um, expense for um, uh, corporations, but it also represents a substantial um, opportunity for sustainability efforts. So, um, you know, benchmarking is going to provide, you know, pay a baseline of measurement, best practices, and then could enable an organization to make data-driven decisions to uh, try to reduce their overall energy uh, consumption and enhance uh, their sustainability. Yeah, so there are a few key energy benchmarking indicators worth mentioning here, uh, specifically energy consumption, carbon footprints, and clean versus dirty energy. Uh, so energy consumption is a fundamental metric used in benchmarking. It provides insights into how efficiently you're using energy resources. It can also help you identify some opportunities for reducing consumption and the costs associated with it. Measuring your carbon footprint actually enables you to better understand uh, your environmental impact. And by quantifying greenhouse gas emissions, you can then set emission reduction goals and track your progress towards them. I really like this quote, uh, and I think it's really relevant here, is you can't manage what you can't measure, right? So it's important to take these things into consideration and track them where possible. Uh, and lastly, distinguishing between clean and dirty energy usage uh, is really crucial for benchmarking. Um, it allows you to gauge your reliance on renewables uh, and also uh, the reduction of emissions associated with those dirtier fossil fuel-based energies like coal. Okay, so we've come to our first poll question. If you work in, in facility management, how important is energy efficiency to your job? Very important, slightly important, neutral, or not important? You have about 20 to 30 seconds to respond. Scott and John, where do you anticipate the responses are going to fall? Oh, go ahead, John. No, I was going to say, I, I mean, I would just, you know, I expect them to be somewhat, you know, pretty important. Um, I doubt if there are any not important at all, but I could be wrong. Yeah, and just based off my experience here at GridPoint, uh, I have worked with many sustainability teams across different organizations. So it is something that's, that I deal with regularly, and it seems to be um, something that's very important to our customers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so your predictions seem right on the money. It's very important, is in the lead with 79% of respondents, followed by slightly important and neutral, and nobody said not important. That's right. Yeah, so, um, you know, that pretty much uh, ties in with um, what uh, our, the, uh, our survey showed which is that 90% of, of those uh, working in facility management were uh, rated it as important to their job. So, you know, I think there's a strong consensus that underscores, uh, you know, crucial uh, role that energy efficiency plays uh, in modern facility management, um, which reflects a growing awareness 
of its economic and environmental significance. So um, what are the benefits of peer comparison and benchmarking? Um, you know, first, it allows you to identify gaps in areas for improvement. So, you know, it offers a, an advantage to, you know, pinpoint performance gaps in areas uh, that you need to improve by comparing, you know, your performance with industry standards of top competitors um, that are in the same, uh, you know, uh, market or segment. Um, and it enhances uh, kind of like your, with that insight, you know, allows you to set goals to um, allow you to become more competitive and successful as well. Uh, it also, you know, allows you to set uh, realistic uh, energy savings and sustainability targets. So, um, you know, if you're able to gauge your performance, you're comparing it against peers or industry norms, uh, you know, you're looking at your best practices compared to the practices of other companies. Um, you know, it's kind of ensuring that you're setting objectives that are both attainable and aligned with a broader, you know, industry standards. So, you know, you're taking a data-driven approach to help your organization establish, you know, meaningful goals, um, you know, fostering a culture of environmental responsibility and resource efficiency. Okay, we've come to our second poll question. Have you seen energy costs rise in the last 12 to 24 months? A significant increase, costs somewhat increased, costs stayed the same or costs have lowered? Again, you have about 20 to 30 seconds to respond. I have a feeling I, uh, I know how this poll is gonna go. I actually had a, a customer reach out last week, just kind of asking us to do an analysis on uh, comparing July of 2022 versus July of 2023 in terms of their set points and unit runtime to kind of see if there was a main difference which caused that increase in utility rate. And interestingly enough, what we found is there really was no significant difference between those two months year over year. So that really didn't explain the, the rise in the utility cost. Mm -hmm. So the results are in. Um... Far and away, uh, most people said it costs somewhat increased with 61% of the vote. And for the remaining vote at 39% said a significant increase. So. Yeah, and uh, we appreciate you guys participating in these polls. It's very useful to gauge our audience and, and better understand how everyone is being affected by rising utility costs. So in our study and poll, we actually saw that 79% of the grid point report respondents saw increases um, in the past 12 to 24 months, which is similar to you all. Um, we actually saw that 27% categorized the increases as significant. Um, there's no surprise, um, these significant increases are likely prompting those surveyed to dedicate additional resources toward energy efficiency and explore new strategies uh, in an attempt to compensate for those rising energy bills. Yeah, so, um, you know, you know, basically last year there was a, you know, a surge um, in inflation uh, of 8%, um, which to me just signifies that, you know, your, your buying power is decreasing, you know, what you can get for the same amount of money. Um, and then also just like over the last several years, you know, commercial uh, industry um, costs have increased as much as 18%, um, you know, with, with, you know, contracts and, you know, things of that nature. And, and, you know, those things eventually roll out and catch up. But to me, it's kind of like a double whammy. You have, you know, less buying power, plus then you're having to pay more for um, your energy. And, you know, obviously there's some overlap there, um, but it can become substantial. Uh, I think as far as companies are concerned, um, you know, the escalating energy costs, you know, companies are going to have to deal with, you know, uh, 
prices for electricity, natural gas, um, and other resources or energy sources are going to erode profit margins. But then that's also going to force them to maybe reconsider uh, budget, budget allocations. Okay, our third poll question. How concerned are you about grid reliability? Extremely concerned, very concerned, somewhat concerned, slightly concerned, or not concerned at all? You know, I think this is one of those questions that, uh, you, you know, if, if you're operating um, facilities, I think if, you know, those answering the question, if they're operating facilities in certain parts of the country, uh, you know, this is going to be high, you know, maybe other locations, you know, not yet. It hasn't quite caught up uh, to those areas, but, you know, we all hear about uh, aging infrastructure and changes. We'll see. Okay, so the, the majority said somewhat concerned with 38%, followed by very concerned with 31%. And extremely concerned was actually the lowest percentage with 8%. Yeah, so grid reliability is another top issue for the professional survey as 94% of them expressed at least some level of concern with actually 62% saying they have significant concern. So a little different than our poll today. Um, but power disruptions, widespread blackouts, you know, pose a serious risk. Um, ensuring guest safety and comfort is really important. Uh, you know, an easy example here would be retailers or restaurants. Um, obviously, if they lose power and cannot serve their customers, they cannot generate revenue. Um, this could be also be a risk to employee or guest safety in the case of a power outage. Uh, these companies definitely want to make sure that their parking lot lights on are in the evening so their guests and employees can safely exit the building and get to their vehicles. And that's something I actually have experience with working with at grid points and doing some of these lighting control um, systems. Uh, so again, some of the other top industries concerned and affected by this are retail, which accounted for 40% of our poll. Financial services was 17%, healthcare were 14, and then the restaurant and food services accounting for 10%. You know, I would just add one thing to that as far as like grid reliability. Um, you guys probably remember or heard in the news like last year, you know, how California, you know, was on the brink of, you know, um, th the grid going down. Um, you know, they was able to prevent that from happening. They didn't reach that threshold. And, you know, as, as a lay person, it's kind of easy to say, well, you know, if they if there was a blackout, you know, it, time would go by and then they would just turn it on. Um, but the reality is if that grid would have gone down, it could have taken a week or weeks to get that whole system brought back online with power being supplied to all of the customers. You know, so for potential for large scale blackouts can actually have a su substantial uh, impact, you know, should they actually occur, you know, um, just depending on the scale, but um, it's a very complex system and uh, things start cascading and then, you know, it, they got to be very careful and, you know, as you, some of you, you know, know, uh, you know, bringing all those things back online, those resources. All right, so we're all facing the energy challenges as there are changes to our energy sources, those new stressors on the electrical grid, and whether that continues to get more extreme as a result of climate change, uh, and also an in, in ever-increasing demand for energy itself. Um, I think everyone here can agree it's more important than ever to make sure commercial buildings are resilient. Um, and it's understandable that there is an ever-growing concern about grid reliability. Uh, we have frequent weather-related disruptions and even cyber threats, which pose a risk to these uninterrupted operations. Many businesses are actually exploring investments in backup power systems, energy storage solutions, and infrastructure to ensure they remain resilient in the face of this grid instability. Um, it's not just building types like hospitals making these kind of investments now. It's many other building types and companies which are exploring these options to protect themselves and their businesses. So we're also seeing an increase 
increase in electricity demand. Factors like population growth, industrial expansion, and the electrification of the transportation system continue to drive up that need for electric power and put even more stress on those aging electrical grids. Um, as I just mentioned, climate change is having a, a large impact on operations, whether it's the heat wave that I know many of you have experienced um, this summer or just more severe storms. Um, it's definitely cause for concern and planning and companies are having to deal with the increases in maintenance costs, the energy consumption and operational disruptions. So this is only pushing us further uh, toward the need for more sustainable building design and resilient infrastructure. Okay, so do you plan to increase energy efficiency efforts in the coming year? Yes or no? What are your predictions, Scott and John, for this? Uh, these responses. I think this is an easy one. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm going to be doing this with with my own house <laughs> in the next <laughs> coming year. So. Wow, a hundred percent said yes. Yeah, so, and, you know, that uh, pretty much matches up with uh, the report, um, you know, vast majority are going to embark on some kind of energy efficiency upgrade, um, you know, this year, 90% uh, of the participants said they plan on uh, increasing energy efficiency uh, improvements. So, you know, I think this kind of signals that, you know, most companies recognize, you know, the various energy challenges that face their buildings or their business, and they do need to uh, deal with these changes. You know, so with, you know, all the concern over energy pricing, you know, possibly grid um, stability, uh, you know, how did we begin to address these problems uh, and make buildings more efficient without the need for like, uh, major building infrastructure changes. Well, um, let's start out with benchmarking. Um, you know, with benchmarking, you start out by assessing, you know, the current landscape for your organization. So, you know, what's your organization goals? Well, you know, probably some of the basics, you know, increase profit, decrease costs. Well, that kind of ties into um, energy uh, usage or reduction and sustainability. Um, you know, maybe you're a uh, organization has some overreaching um, energy or sustainability goals. Um, you, you know, what are the available resources you have? Do you have people who are in charge with implementing um, uh, something, um, you know, an energy or sustainability effort? You know, maybe it falls on your shoulders. Um, you know, what about data collection capabilities? Do you have the ability to like accurately um, collect energy on your, your energy usage or perhaps maybe your carbon footprint. Um, so once you can kind of identify, you know, those things, you start to develop a clear um, objective as far as like, hey, these are the things that we need to do. Um, and here's how we're, the industry peers that we want to benchmark against. So um, now let's go out and start collecting data. Um, next, you actually go out and you gather your energy usage data for your facilities. Um, and then you start benchmarking a little bit more specifically about the peers. Um, you know, hey, what areas are we going to uh, compare against other organizations? Um, you know, what are their best practices? Um, we want to gather data on what we're doing, what they're doing, and then we're going to benchmark the data between um, you know, our goals, the best practices we see out there, um, and then try to develop an understanding from the comparison of us and others and identify best practices and develop a strategy for us to improve. Um, and then finally, it's, you know, setting a goal for your organization. So after you've completed the benchmarking evaluation, you know, you want to make sure you're setting sustainable energy goals um, for your organization, you know, that's based on the insight that you, you uh, gathered. 
Um, and you're going to make measurable uh, objectives that you can measure as you're improving um, against these uh, metrics. And um, you're, if you do that, your um, goal should take into account your current uh, energy usage uh, performance and then what are your strategies to reduce that consumption, improve efficiency and, you know, support your initiatives. Yeah, so benchmark can be a really powerful tool. Um, grid points actually doing this now and the way that we're doing that is essentially assigning a point value system to the different control strategies that can be put in place, whether that's occupied, unoccupied set points, um, any algorithms that are enabled, um, override thresholds, that sort of thing. That way we can calculate a score for each individual company and then compare that to the vertical and let you know exactly how you're performing um, in comparison to your peers. So on the other side of that, um, there's actually ways that you can compare a site versus itself and look at its performance over time. Uh, and this is really getting into what I do um, at GridPoint on a daily basis here. So this is a, a method, again, used to track site performance. It's IPMVP, which is the International Performance Measurement and Verification Protocol. It's quite a mouthful. We're just gonna stick with IPMVP today. Um, it was originally developed by the Efficiency Valuation Organization uh, to actually help increase investment into energy efficiency projects, demand management, um, and also um, renewable energy projects. Uh, however, today it's considered the international standard for calculating energy savings and is widely accepted across the globe. So as you can see here, uh, there are many core principles. Um, it's designed to be accurate, conservative, and transparent among other things. Um, and the way that this works is we take a single site uh, and compare its current energy consumption to that of its historical baseline. So this methodology actually requires a minimum of 12 months worth of historical utility bills. That way we can understand the relation between a site's energy consumption and the weather conditions driving that. So then once we have a model, we can actually input current weather conditions to calculate the expected energy consumption had the site not implemented those energy efficiency measures, whether that's energy management or, uh, or renewables or anything like that. And then we can actually compare the model usage versus the actual utility bills. Uh, and the difference there is going to be your energy savings. Again, this site to self approach. Um, with this methodology, it really doesn't make sense to compare two buildings that may have slightly different builds, uh, foot traffic, or are in two different geographic locations. So this is really the best way to analyze the impact of an energy efficiency project um, at a single location. Here's another poll. What strategies do you plan to implement in the coming year? Carbon accounting reporting, demand response slash demand reporting, utility energy efficiency programs, EV charging, renewable energy sources, or submetering. You have about 20 to 30 seconds. I think demand response and demand management are, are going to be a big one here. It seems to be an ever growing need to go ahead and, and try to make that group more reliable. So that's a good one. And and I would hedge my bet on submetering, but I'm a little biased because I like doing that. <laughs> okay, so the majority said uh, utility energy efficiency programs with 37%, followed by carbon account reporting at 26%. And I believe renewable energy sources submeting were both 11%, and then demand response slash demand management was actually 7%, along with EV charging. I guess I was a little off on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we both were. Um, you know, I, I do think um, when you look at, um, you know, the response that we have, the response from that group, um, I think it does demonstrate that you know, professionals in the industry are going to look at taking a deeper dive into the technologies that are going to allow them 
to work on these various strategies. Um, you know, our respondents had, you know, I, I think they kind of matched, you know, carbon, uh, carbon accounting was pretty high at 40%. Uh, demand response and demand management was 39%. Um, energy efficiency programs was 39%. Um, EV charging was 39%. Renewables, 38 And submetering was 38 You know, so now that we've talked about, um, you know, the various challenges, um, you know, the various uh, things associated with it, you know, what is a solution that we can implement, you know, or some of that technology we briefly uh, touched on? That is where a uh, energy management system comes into place. Um, it's also often referred to as EMS. You know, so it's a comprehensive set of tools that enables an organization to monitor and control energy consumption, you know, across operations and facilities. Um, it can play a vital role in providing real-time data insights on usage um, and enable inefficiencies and, and waste um, and, and overall enhancement to be identified and, you know, corrective action or, or or performance increase can happen. Um, you know, to me, a EMS system, you know, integrates a lot of things together. Um, it can do monitoring and control of HVAC systems. Um, it has the ability to automatically um, initiate demand response programs, you know, should you decide to participate. You can monitor uh, energy uh, from EV charging, from solar, um, you can monitor um, and alarm refrigeration temperatures. Um, you can do lighting control and monitor that. Um, so there's a lot of things that it integrates together. It also brings that together in a software platform that takes um, in solution that takes advantage of IoT technology and cloud computing so that you know solutions can be available uh, you know via computer or a mobile, a device such as a smartphone. Um, you know, to me, I think, um, you know, without an EMS system in place, you know, a commercial building, the operation of it can somewhat be a black box. Um, you don't really know what's going on at a particular location until maybe you get a phone call that there's some problem going on. Um, you don't necessarily understand the energy usage until you get the bill at the end of the month. Um, and, and with an EMS, you can actually get real-time data um, about what's going on. So um, it gives you an opportunity to try to influence, correct, or troubleshoot what's going on at a site or facility, you know, without actually having to send somebody there um, uh, or, or drive there yourself. So it's, it's a way to drive energy savings. Um, and you might say, yeah, hey, look, John, that, that sounds great, but you know, I'm managing a bunch of smaller systems and you know, what you're describing sounds like you know, what I'm familiar with as a BAS system. And um, you know, traditionally, um, yeah, that was probably true. Um, you know, this kind of technology would only be for a fairly large, complex, maybe multi-story building. Um, but nowadays with the new technology, you know, the, the threshold to be able to implement a system has substantially lowered. Um, and once again, with this, you know, network-based cloud technology, we could take 30 smaller buildings and turn that into a larger EMS system you know, creating a large pseudo BAS um, if you want. Um, and, and so now you can take advantages of being able to manage, you know, a portfolio of buildings. Um, you, you know, maybe you're on the other side of that. You're like, well, we've already got, you know, a BAS system in place at, at these buildings. Um, you know, an EAS um, can be complementary to an existing uh, building automation system. Um, it can gather lots of information on, um, uh, you know, systems outside the BAS, like the, the energy monitoring and, and gather all of that data and analytics. And then, you know, that information could be used to 
then make changes in your BAS and control it in a manner that would then provide the savings. So, um, so depending on which side you're on, you know, would be a little bit different solution, but it's all based on the same principles, the same technology. All right, so demand management, you know, what is it? How do we achieve it? Um, you can think of this as like a balancing act between the peak demand that utilities can provide and the stress that's actually being put on the grid. Um, you know, if there's too much stress, we could see things like blackouts. Um, so we need to be able to understand that relationship, plan and forecast those events, and execute man response events in order to not overwhelm the grid. Right, so companies like Gridpoint uh, can assist you with this task. We can work directly with the utilities to find incentives. We get to forecast those events, uh, enroll your site, and then actually execute the demand response. Um, and lastly, you can actually report on the success and savings of doing so. So this is a really powerful tool that allows you to participate, receive those incentives, and get payout from the utility, while also achieving some energy savings. So I mentioned some of those benefits. Um, the one big thing here that I wanted to point out is that you can get those benefits without, with having little to no impact to site comfort, right? That's the goal. You want a, a demand response event to take place and not cause your employees or guests uh, to be uncomfortable. And that's a big thing for us. You know, we don't want to save a dollar here if we're really making your occupants uncomfortable. We really need to find the balance between comfort and energy savings. Um, so it's really important for us to create a customized curtailment strategy for businesses based on their specific needs. So um, submetering. So submetering is um, is a portion uh, of hardware or technology that adds in to the EMS. Um, you know, it allows you to collect granular data on loads that are drawing energy at a facility. Um, you know, if, if you just get a, a, if all you, if you don't have any metering in place, all you have is a bill and, you know, what was used. Um, if you have a meter, you can actually start to identify, you know, when things, um, you know, when, when your overall energy consumption was used and maybe when you set a new peak demand and there's strategies and control algorithms to help uh, mitigate those. Um, and then with the sub metering, you're actually able to get down to individual loads and understand those, you know, how much are we spending on HVAC? How much are we spending specifically on lighting? You know, perhaps how much are you spending on an oven? You know, whatever it is that is energy consumption, um, high loads, those can be monitored. Um, you know, additionally, you can get information on, you know, power quality. So you can understand if, you know, power quality issue is causing your facility problems, which is going to degrade the, you know, the uh, life of the equipment. Um, you can, um, you know, take the information that you've collected and you can analyze it. One of the things that I think is really important or, or useful in metering is when you have the ability to graft um, not only individual loads, but like what loads, when they're using energy, and how much. Um, one of the keys is looking at time of use. If you're able to actually graphically trend when various loads are using energy, it's pretty easy to identify, hey, we've got loads that are using energy in the middle of the night. Why is that on? Is there something that's been configured improperly? Is it an operational training issue that we need to make sure that they're turning things off? Um, you know, we've had got an example of one customer using submetering. They was able to identify equipment that was being left on. And I want to say it was being left on to the tune of like over a thousand places. And they figured out that by doing an operational change, they was going to be able to influence or impact their energy savings by over a million dollars. So, you know, once again, you know, being able to understand when and where it's 
being used gives you an opportunity to do something about that. Um, yeah, and I have an interesting one here, John, as well. Um, yeah. We actually found that one of our customers' sites um, had their neighbor's lighting circuit tied into their main load meter. So we were actually able to use that sub-metering, the data we had available to prove that out to them so they could go to the utility company and get that separated. So really powerful stuff. Yeah. So, and, and then the final thing is, you know, if you have other um, loads such as, you know, renewables, you know, solar, um, you know, you can include that in a power monitoring system. You know, I've looked at, at trends or graphs of, you know, customers that, you know, hey, their, their energy, you know, rises during the day as they're in the peak hours and then drop off. But then when you look at the utility bill, it follows somewhat a similar curve, but it's a lot smaller. And then you realize, ah, the difference between how much they're using and how much they're paying the utility company is that solar. You know, you're actually able to measure that. And I want to say in that circumstance, um, they, they don't even have to do battery storage. They basically just invert it and turn right around and use it right off the bat. So it's really kind of uh, cool to see that, you know, um, how that can affect, uh, once again, uh, energy conservation measures and sustainability. All right, so how do we get started? And I know this may seem like it could be an expensive or complicated task, um, but that's really a misconception. Um, the first step could be something as simple as taking a walk through your facility and performing a basic energy audit, just understanding what is consuming energy and when. Um, and if you can identify some low cost, no cost measures that can be taken, you're well on your way to going ahead and optimizing that building performance. So energy audits can be a powerful tool to identify building changes that can save energy and reduce those energy costs. Um, Gridpoint actually offers a cost-free energy audit and will send experts out into the field uh, to evaluate up to five facility locations. Um, while doing the energy audit, they can actually identify ways to improve HVAC systems, lighting, and even building envelope to, uh, to reduce your overall operating costs. Uh, we can then leverage that data to provide easy and actual measures that will uh, save you money. Uh, and as I mentioned before, those low cost, no cost measures are really simple to start out with and then move on to more involved or costly measures such as uh, an LED retrofit, for example. Um, and it's a really great place to start your building optimization journey. So one of the really great things available now is a subscription model base. So we typically call this energy management as a service or EMAS. Uh, it's not something that you set and forget it like a smart thermostat and hope that it achieves those intended savings goals. Um, there's no large upfront fees to worry about and the energy and operational savings uh, more than covers that monthly subscription fee. Uh, so this is really a no brainer in, in a lot of cases. Um, again, I, I think it's a little bit of a misconception that this is going to be expensive and complicated. Um, as you see on the graph here, many companies can actually get rebates um, from just enrolling in an energy management system, which is already going to go ahead and offset that monthly subscription fee. Uh, and then if you look on the right hand side of this slide, you can see that the energy and operational savings are more going to pay than pay for the rest. Um, I can personally say that I've never had a customer that did not meet their ROI goal or their break even point. Um, so this is a really great way to start achieving some benchmarking goals without dipping into a CapEx budget, for example. And, you know, I would add one little small thing to that, um, at least with our offering, you know, it is a turnkey offering that includes the complete installation, testing and commissioning of the system. So you know, with, with somewhat minimal uh, effort uh, on your part, um, you could get a system installed and up and working uh, very easily. So, um, you know, we've, we've reached the end here. Um, I, get, I guess four key takeaways, uh, you know, energy efficiency uh, is a priority for most commercial buildings uh, in 
2023, you know, peer comparison and benchmarking, you know, helps companies set achievable goals. Um, you know, reducing energy uh, usage uh, is a top concern uh, of the industry. Uh, you know, getting started with benchmarking with a, you know, no cost audit um, and a no cap X uh, prescription model um, makes it pretty straightforward. Um, you know, so there's a lot of different um, information or detailed information that's available um, on our uh, grid point commercial energy savings uh, or energy efficiency report, you know, such as you're like, hey, I, I don't have a, an EMS. I wonder how many companies do. You know, we've, there's some pieces of additional data in that report. Uh, and I do believe that we're going to have a be sending out a follow up email so that um, you can download your own copy. Thank you. All right, Scott, John, thank you so much for this presentation today. And thank you to our attendees for sending in some questions. So we'll now begin um, some Q&A. So George here looks like he was asking, how can facility managers align their energy efficiency and sustainability goals with the broader objectives of their organization? Um, you know, I would say that um, uh, one of them is, uh, you know, most companies have goals of, you know, increasing profit, uh, you know, uh, decreasing cost. Um, you know, I think energy management um, EMS system uh, can tie directly into that. Um, so at least from a financial standpoint, um, you know, um, it tie, should tie in to most companies' objectives. And then once again, if your company happens to have any kind of initiatives, you know, once again, this is uh, ties right into that energy initiative. All right, Scott, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think John did a great job yeah. answering that one. Great. <laughs> All right, another question we have here is um, from Denise. Um, can you share any key recommendations or best practices for a company um, who hasn't taken any steps towards energy efficiency at this point? Yeah, I, I can take this one. Um, I would say start with an energy audit, right? It's, it's going to be really beneficial to understand how your site is consuming energy and why, uh, and then starting off with those low cost, no cost measures first, and then moving on to, to more expensive ones. Um, from a control standpoint, I would say that um, your optimization of your HVAC schedules and your set points are going to be your biggest drivers for energy savings. So I would say um, make sure you're putting in reasonable set points and changing those uh, seasonally in order to capture the energy savings that's available. Um, for example, you may not need to have, you know, a, a faster restaurant uh, have a cooling set point in the kitchen of, you know, 65. And I have seen that before. Um, <laughs> it's likely never going to actually reach that set point. So making sure you're putting in a control strategy that is going to find a balance between the energy savings and comfort is really going to be the goal. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And then John, what about you? Do you have anything to, to add to that or? No, um, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm one of the people that, that go out and do um, the, um, the surveys on site. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a, a, a lot that we learned from a survey that I think is pretty eye-opening for customers that were able to report back after we've gone out and done a survey. So, um, you know, it's just all part of the process of doing a financial evaluation um, along with, you know, energy bills to figure out, hey, let's, you know, let's do this. It makes a great business case um, or not. Perfect. Um, I think we have time for, you know, one or two more questions here. Uh, it looks like Greg is asking, do you need to be technically savvy to utilize IoT enabled devices for sustainability purposes? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll take that one too. Um, you know, um, no, I mean, part of the, you know, our particular um, solution, you know, we've tried to make it as simple and as user friendly as possible. You know, the software is embedded inside a platform that we're all used to, to using, you know, a web browser, you know, the ability to use an app 
on your phone to be able to access data. Um, and then also, you know, you don't have to be a technology expert to, to drive savings, you know, the ability to be able to manage set points, to set up schedules um, and, and things of that nature, that's very valuable and that can drive energy savings. Um, so I think it's pretty accessible for uh, most, uh, if not everybody. All right, awesome. Scott, do you have anything else to add or are you, you good? <laughs> oh, I think I'm good, thank you. <laughs> All right, perfect. Well, it looks like we are out of time. Thank you both so much for um, this presentation today and to Gridpoint for sponsoring this webinar. Of course, thank you to our audience for attending today. A recording from today's session will be made av available on our magazine's website, facilityexecutive.com and at gridpoint.com. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.